yourself a cold one. They strike them, huh? And listen to Ross Tucker break down the top college prospects on another tasty edition of The College Draft. Daddy Soda time here on the College Draft Podcast, presented, of course, as always, by DraftKings. And yes, we are recording this live on Memorial Day Monday. You know why? Because it's football season. We had a boatload of college football games the last couple days. One more tonight, by the way. Clemson and Duke to watch. A little Monday night football, college style. And of course, we'll have week two coming up. So, Here's the format for the show. We'll quickly review Emery's bets from a week ago and then just talk a little bit about some of the themes that we saw from the week that was in college football, whether it's prospects that jumped out or just themes that go all across college football. And then, of course, we'll look ahead to the biggest games in week two of college football and the best prospects that you should be watching on your TV screen when you're watching these games. I'm at Ross Tucker NFL on social media. Love those of you that take advantage of any of our sponsors. As a reminder, if you ever do that, take advantage of any of them that you hear me talk about or that you see over at RossTucker.com, just go ahead and email me, Ross at RossTucker.com with the confirmation. You'll have a great chance to win one of these awesome signed press passes for one of these games I broadcast at, which is always a lot of fun. Emery is at F ball game plan on Twitter, football game plan on YouTube, football game plan dot com slash twenty twenty four draft guide. And I would say the combo of Emery calling the one of the wildest endings of any game I've ever seen, plus Emery being way ahead of everybody, like way, 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 way ahead of everybody when it came to Shador Sanders. Deion Sanders, Travis Hunter, I mean, you know, Emory's been talking about these guys for two years at Jackson State, it seems like. So, kudos to you, Emory. I think you won the weekend, my friend. It was a great weekend, Ross, man. And um, what was funny, really bothers me, though, you know, standing on my little soapbox for a second, it's the fact that you have all of these draft analysts, all of these so-called study the tape, watch the film, all this that they say all throughout the year, and Saturday was the first time you got to see Shadur Sanders throw football. Saturday was the first time you realized Deion Sanders had a son that played quarterback. Saturday was the first time you realized this guy actually plays a position like a top five quarterback in this draft class. Saturday was the first time you realized that he might be really good. So miss me with all of that talk that everybody was doing over the weekend. Oh, wow, who could have seen this? You, you go and check your favorite draft analyst timeline. The only time they tweeted about Shador Sanders was Saturday. All five or six of their Shador Sanders tweets came from Saturday. You go back and watch my timeline or lock into this show, you see us talking about Shador Sanders and Deion Sanders and also Travis Hunter since then. So, said I'd like to say this, Ross. This is where the folks need to be because at the end of the day, you're going to get ahead of all of these prospects. We're going to tell you, who should who you should be watching because we actually watch the tape. I can't imagine being a draft analyst and not knowing who this potential top quarterback is going to be because I was too busy watching my 19th game of CJ Stroud or 28th game of Bryce Young just to see how good they really are. Like a lot of guys got exposed on Saturday. You know, the other thing is, and I, mean, I was going to get into the themes a little bit later, but now that we're talking about it, let's talk about it. I thought whether people realize it or not, that the performance of Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter was a huge positive for FCS football in general and HBCU in particular. Because those guys, yeah, they were very, very good players in the HBCUs at the FCS level. They were the be- you know among the best players in all of FCS football. But... They tore up TCU worse than they tore up anybody else they've ever torn up. I mean, this is, oh, this is TCU, and they were in the national championship game. They didn't put up numbers like this 
even in the HBCU, or and maybe because they had the big lead, they didn't need to, or whatever. But my point is, I, I, I am always amused at how people don't realize how small the difference is between those levels at times. And the crazy part is, Ross, to your point, they didn't put up these type of numbers in the Celebration Bowl in the game that everybody was watching. Not against South Carolina State with Buddy Pugh, who's going to retire after this season, and not against North Carolina Central last season. So they had to work harder against those teams than they did against TCU. And before everyone says, oh, TCU lost a lot of players, everyone outside of this podcast expected them to go out there and get blown out by TCU. That didn't happen. Had they lost that game and played a competitive game, people still would have talked bad about Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter, but it didn't happen. They gave them no out. So now people are saying, well, we'll see against Nebraska. As if the 95 Nebraska Cone Huskers is going to be out there. No, they're going to do the same thing this upcoming weekend as well. Love it, Emery. Uh, that was obviously one of the bets that you got right last week. You liked Colorado getting the 20 and a half points. You didn't need any of them. Not any of them. You also were all over the Thursday night game laying the points with Utah. We got an email, or maybe it was a YouTube comment, maybe both, about people that said, how's Emory going to pick Utah to win this game when they don't have Cam Rising? How's Emory going to pick Utah when, and not even mention their quarterback situation? Well, evidently the other two guys they had were pretty good. I mean, the one guy comes in, throws a bomb touchdown. The other kid can run like lightning. So Utah is so impressive to me. Uh, they just are good. I mean, they don't get the same players that Florida does. They just go out there and smash them. They kill these teams. Uh, that was awesome. Um, so you, those are your two wins. UVA, Tennessee, UVA just got blown out of the water. I don't know if that was an emotional thing or what. Uh, UNC, South Carolina. You rolled with South Carolina, and UNC uh, was able to, to handle that. But UNC much better defensively and running the ball than I think anybody expected. And then let's talk briefly about LSU, Florida State last night. You had LSU. Florida State really pulled away from those dudes. That surprised me. Surprised me a lot. What really surprised me was how Harold Perkins was playing off-ball linebacker as opposed to being Harold Perkins, which changed the complexity of the game. It was almost like last year's game where he only played special teams and then he became Harold Perkins at the end. So you, you're wondering, like, why wasn't he doing this against Florida State? Because he didn't play as much on the regular defense. Well, he didn't play much – you know, last night compared to what we thought we were going to see. And also uh, what really stood out was how ineffective LSU was running the football. Florida State was able to run the ball when they wanted to, which is key. And they had the better stable of backs, which is something you never thought you'd say about an LSU football team with the lineage of backs that they've had coming through that program. So LSU has some work to do in terms of their run game and their defense should be better because they'll have Mason Smith back uh, next week, and they'll also probably figure out, like they did last year, you know what, let's put Harold Perkins in a position where he can just be Harold Perkins instead of trying to create a whole new position. I joked online that they had him playing Invisibacker last night because it was like they were playing out there with 10 men. Like, where was Harold Perkins? He did a solid job versus some, some of the run uh, game, but just didn't do um, what we expected him to do, and that gave Jordan Travis a lot more time than he – was expecting to throw the football, and we saw how well Keon Coleman was just manhandling those LSU de defensive backs. So, yeah, clearly whiffed on that one um, and definitely whiffed on South Carolina. I didn't expect their old line to be a catastrophe like it was too. Well, hopefully better times are ahead for the people down there in Louisiana. Hopefully that includes Sunday when the Saints host the Titans. I'll be there, Emery, calling my first NFL game for CBS. I got a chance to call – Oregon State, San Jose State yesterday. We'll get into that momentarily. But if you want to go to the Saints game, it's all about the game time app. Right now, pretty surprising. Home opener for the Saints. You can get in for 59 bucks. There's other tickets for $63. And you know because it's the game time app that you'll always get the best price. There's really no reason to ever have any other app on your phone because there's the game time guarantee. If they find tickets in the same section in a row for less, game time credits you 110% of the difference. Huge fan. This is how I get all my tickets for concerts, everything. Snag the tickets without the stress with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code DRAFT 
for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code DRAFT for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. You know, it's interesting, Emery. At my game, DJ Ui Ungala. Oh my gosh, dude. I practiced this so many times. Ui Unga Lele. Lele. It's unbelievable how many times I practice that. And then when I do it like this, I butcher it. Um, but he looked awesome. Now, Oregon State's offensive line is fantastic. And he had a ridiculous amount of time to throw. But, man, that he, he kind of reminds me a little bit of, and I know this is like not a positive to people, he reminds me of Jamarcus Russell. Like when he stands tall in the pocket and just uncorks one, it is like a rocket or a laser beam. And with their ability to run the ball and their O-line, you know, then they do play action pass. He has five seconds. Those little receivers get open down the field. He tattoos them with the football. Oregon State's going to be a tough out. And, and I watched that game, and you did a fantastic job, by the way. Uh, nice open press box at San Jose State. Uh, I'm just a little disappointed they didn't build stands on the opposite side. They went ahead and built that whole complex. Looks great, by the way. But I was like, oh, man, I was just only – it looks weird on TV, right? But uh, you're right. When he when – it's, it's kind of like Joe Milton when he throws a ball where – you see the, you, okay, it's a deep throw, it's a post, but the fact that he's able to shrink space so quickly with the way he throws the football with the velocity, and you touched on it, a lot of those far hash throws that he were making, you know, with the college hash marks being wide and going across the field, yeah, some of them was dying at the end, but that's still a very long throw that requires a lot of arm strength. If they could continue to do that, operate off play action where, you give him a little bit of time, and those guys can keep running like these Tennessee wide receivers do with Joe Milton, Oregon State can really put pressure on your defense because he has such a rocket arm. Yeah, they certainly can. I, I was very impressed with their O-line. That Martinez kid's a legit running back. And then obviously DJ. I hope he has a great year. You know, I mean, I said this during the game, Emery, but – you know, when you're like the number one recruit, it's almost like expected that you're going to end up being three years later the number one pick in the draft. That's hard to do. And like everybody, your family, friends, they all start to like count on that. That's a lot, man. That's a lot. Everybody's counting on you to, to, to be number one overall pick. There can only be one. It's hard to do. It's really hard to do. Especially when you have your contemporaries like you brought up, which is a great point. Stroud and Young, they're going number one. It's like, or number one, and they're going the first round. It's like, Man, what's up with you, DJ? When are you going to go? That's a lot to live up to, especially when you're replacing uh, Trevor Lawrence. At, so he had a lot going up up against him, and I'm like, you. Yeah, I hope he does uh, really well because I want to see him have success. I want to have some Labatt Blue Lights today. Now that I'm back home in Pennsylvania with my family, little uh, Labor Day, grilling out, taking things to the next level, drinking some Labatt Blue Lights with friends and living life to the power of we. Always enjoy responsibly beer, Labatt USA, Buffalo, New York. All right, Emery, let's look ahead to this week a little bit. If we have time for some more discussion of last week, we will. But we got Texas A&M playing at Miami. A couple of teams that both got wins last week. Miami is getting four points, even though they're playing at home. I think that's interesting. It's at Miami. I thought Miami looked pretty good. Friday night against the Miami Red Hawks from Ohio. Now they're hosting Texas A&M, which I love, by the way. I love decent, you know, non-conference games. I, I, I love to have some of these. Penn State, West Virginia, you know, obviously LSU, Florida State was incredible, but just give me something. Give me, give me something that is interesting. Texas A&M at Miami. First of all, I guess, who, who are we watching this one? Well, we're watching quarterback Tyler Van Dyke for Miami. Remember, he had a lot of first-round buzz going into last season and didn't really pan out. And this is the type of game where you can have people get back on your, your bandwagon, so to speak. So I'm excited to see how he plays. But all throughout the weekend, Texas A&M, we watched watching former Texas A&M quarterbacks compete. King at Georgia Tech. And then we see Calzada at Incarnate Word. Okay, well, let's see Texas A&M now, who's coming up a very good win, expected against New Mexico. This is a big game because this is the who's back bowl, right? Whoever wins this game, the hype is going to be tremendous. A&M is back or Miami is back. So I'm excited to see it from that perspective, but also 
see what Tyler Van Dyke can do because he was someone that people talked a lot about coming into the last season. What what are you doing with the spread here, Emery, with Miami catching four points at home? Yeah, this would be a closer game. I, I will take Miami in the points. I feel like it's more of a field goal game. Uh, I like the way the Canes came out and shut up the Red Hawks because they were doing a lot of chirping leading up to the game. Talk about we're going to show them who's the real Miami, and that didn't work out for them as soon as the game started. Um, and a ms defense looks pretty doggone good. It's hard to be terrible when you have that much talent on both sides of the ball. Talk about four- and five-star talent. So I think we'll see a game that will come down to the wire. So four points is a little bit too much, but if it was three, I, I'd be more inclined to lean Texas A&M. Next up, another big one involving a, a Texas team. It's the Longhorns. They're down at Alabama. What a huge game. Texas at Alabama. And the Crimson Tide are laying seven right now at home. And we're looking at uh, Quinn Ewers. You know, it's, last week was a good game for Texas, but you still left, you know, there's some things that he's leaving out there on the field, a lot more meat left on the bones. But if you go back to last year, if you could just bottle up the Quinn Ewers that played briefly against Alabama, that's the guy you want to see as a prospect. But also if you're Texas, you want to see him play like that the entire game. I'm pretty sure Texas had this game circled uh, since that game ended because they felt like they got wronged by the refs. They had an opportunity to win if – Yours was out there. And I'm also excited to see Jalen Milrow. I mean, that was a bigger question coming in for Alabama. And he looked okay. He looked okay last week. I, granted, it was, you know, um, Middle Tennessee State. I get it. But at the end of the day, you only could perform how you could perform. And he went out there and performed well. So can he stack back-to-back solid performances? And this Texas team is stacked on both sides of the ball. This will be another close game. I am taking Texas and the points here. Seven seems like a lot, and what is at stake for the Longhorns here, I think we'll get another one of these closer games, probably a three-point game either way. You know, it's interesting, Emery. Um, Jalen Milrow, when he had that play where the ball fumbled the snap and he picked it up and ran it for a touchdown, <clears throat> he's number four. He looks like T.J. Yeldon. <laughs> like he look, Remember T.J. Yeldon, number four for Alabama? Mm-hmm. You watch number four for Alabama run like Miller. I was like, was it was like a TJ Yeldon had, had another year of eligibility from the COVID year? He's playing quarterback now? Look crazy. Yeah, just so fast. He, he's like legit 4-3 speed. And if and he has that DJ Uyangalele arm strength as well. So if the touch starts to come into play and the anticipation gets uh, lined up with the timing and, and with the velocity, it could get scary down there at Alabama. So – that's going to be a fun game to watch. Also, Kool-Aid McKinstry, the outstanding corner, against any one of those Texas wide receivers is going to be a big deal for him and also for Texas. If he could take away one of the excellent options for Quinn Ewers, it's going to be a fantastic day defensively for Alabama. So there's a lot of intriguing matchups, games within the games that we're going to be watching as a country on Saturday. Yeah, I'll be curious to see whether or not Texas can hold up with the O-line and D-line for Alabama just to see how far Texas has come up front on both sides of the ball. And obviously they don't have Bijan or Roshan Johnson anymore. Uh, you mentioned the 4-3 speed for Milrow. You're talking about fast. Did the game go to timeout? It's time to order on DoorDash. Wait, is it halftime? That's ordering time. Two-minute warning? You got it. That's your cue to order in. Get everything you want delivered while you root for your squad. Yeah, that means burgers, fries, drinks, you name it. And if you have a Dash Pass membership, you can get the new Wendy's Loaded Nacho Cheeseburger delivered. Yeah, right now, the Loaded Nacho Cheeseburger is exclusively available with Dash Pass at participating U.S. Wendy's for a limited time. I never heard of a nacho cheeseburger, by the way, Emery. Have you? Never. I'm, I'm, I'm curious now. I'm intrigued. All right, well, we got to talk about uh, Colorado. Boy, that was quick. Now they're favored <laughs> at home against Nebraska. That is wild. I would love to see what the look-ahead line was like a week ago. Um, it's totally flipped now. Colorado favored at home against Nebraska. Obviously, the hype will be 
big time this week out in Boulder. Yeah, and here's the thing. We know for sure what the Buffs will do offensively. I'm shocked TCU just didn't lean in and continue to run the football against Colorado. I didn't think that would have been their best bet to win that game. But the ego gets involved. They want to match points, try to throw it to. You find yourself in a shootout. That's what happened with App State and Michigan. All Michigan had to do was just line up and just run, you know, Mike Hart the rest of the game, and they would have beaten App State. But now we want to throw the ball too. That's not that that you now they got you where they want you. And so that's what happened to TCU. In this game, the biggest matchup is going to be Colorado's defense versus the offense of Nebraska. We saw the offense of Nebraska, in a way, give the game away against Minnesota, and they're going to have to play better. They were inconsistent offensively. The defense for Jackson State, I mean, Jackson State, fraudulent slip there. They, huh. they have to, uh, Colorado's defense has to play significantly better up front. And we'll see if Nebraska will lean into what they used to be running the football when these matchups, when this matchup was a big time matchup after Thanksgiving in the Big Eight. And then the Big 12, where they just ran the football, we'll see if that happens. But for Colorado, obviously, because of their offense, because of their ability to play at a breakneck pace with a quarterback that makes excellent decisions, I'm going to lay the points with Colorado. I think they win at – you know how electric this atmosphere is going to be? Folsom Field coming off a big upset win against a rival now in Nebraska coming in. This may be the loudest, most in, exciting game that – Colorado has ever played and this is a program that's had national championship teams you know in the 90s right so it's going to be insane atmosphere out there in Boulder and the prospect to watch obviously because I'm gonna keep banging this drum because I want these draft analysts and fans of the draft to realize who does the work watch Shadur Sanders and I'm glad you retweeted the tweet about him being Joe Burrow because now all of a sudden that people are trying to find ways to to talk about Shadur, they were shocked that he could, you know, have this many passes. Like, why? What, what he only did this at Jackson State for the last two seasons, you know. So what, what's new? What's the revelation? Now everybody's gonna try to push him up in their QB talk, and maybe he's QB three. I, I, I love it, Ross, because now you already know who's the source. So I'm laying this on, you know, uh, Colorado. I think they take care of business. I think they get off to a great start at home against Nebraska. Well, and that video was from August 1st, right? Like Twitter, you can see what the timeline is. That video was August 1st before he really did anything at the FBS level. Oh, you were- and I, I didn't mean to cut you off. There's a video out there from July when I was on CBS Sports HQ where I said my dark horse Heisman candidate was Shadura Sanders. And at that time, he was plus 10,000. You know what the odds are right now for Shadura Heisman? It's like 40 to 1. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That is nuts. What about the last one we'll get into? Wisconsin at Washington State. Washington State's getting four at home. This is a game Washington State went out there to Camp Randall and beat them last year. Uh, so I'm excited to see this. And obviously, you know, I'm going to talk about Braylon Allen. 6'2", 245, like nine years old. You know, this, this he keeps getting younger every year, right? Like every year he just gets younger and younger and younger. So he's out there like... He's eight years old, but he's built like a grown man. Just running through every every defense. But last year, we saw Washington State kind of keep him contained. But they also had Deion Henley, who was doing great things in the preseason with the the Los Angeles Chargers. So we'll see if this defense can be the same. And you know we've talked about Cam Ward at nauseum on this show when he was at Incarnate Word. And now he's over at Washington State. He had a great game last week. Last weekend, you want to see him continue to find that consistency and push the ball a little bit more vertically down the field. I think they throw a lot of quick, short passes, but he's someone that can really work touchdown to check down, and they're going to need him to be Cam Ward in this game because the defense is different at Washington State, and we're going to see if they can stop the run again this year, which is very tough to do against breakneck pace. Um, They're giving four points. Um, I'm going to take them plus four. I feel like this is a game they've, they can come in with confidence and like, hey, we beat this team last year. You know, all we got to do is just rally around, stop the run, make them beat us throwing the football where our athletes are, and we'll see if they can do that on a consistent basis. So I think this one is, again, should be a three, two point spread as opposed to four. You know, Emery, one of my big takeaways from the weekend, I don't know if I can ever remember college football having this many good quarterbacks. I mean, there's a lot of good quarterbacks. I think it's the transfer portal. I really do. Like, I think 
you know, all these guys that move around, it enables all these programs to have, like, legit quarterbacks. Very impressive. Speaking of legit, footballgameplan.com slash 2024 draft guide. Look, why don't you get ahead of the game now like Emery does here on this show? Other than that, the keg is kicked. We are all tapped out. Thanks for tuning in to College Draft. Make sure to also check out the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, Even Money, and Fantasy Feast, all on the DraftKings Network on Samsung TV Plus, YouTube, or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform.